Well, yeah, my name's Adam. It's lovely to be with you. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look at a psalm together today, psalm number three. And uh, we thought about the fact that God is light already. And uh, his word is light as well, isn't it? His word is a light to our feet. Um, it's a lamp. And that's for children and for older people. I won't look at anyone in particular. Uh, it's for, for any age, okay? God, God's word is a light. And we can all understand it. And we can all apply it and live by it. And I pray that as we, together as a family, I don't know many of you very well, but as a family, as we look at this psalm, I pray that it would be useful for us. Shall I pray before we read God's word? Father God, I thank you for, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's unchanging and it's lasting and it's fruitful. And I thank you that it's something that we can find delight in. We can be like that blessed man of Psalm 1 who delights in your word, hides it in our heart, and lives by it. And I pray, Lord, this morning, whether we're young or old, uh, whether we've come in skipping in with joy, or whether we've come in with our heads held low, I pray that something of your word would, would resonate in our hearts. It would move us. Lord, where we are a bit sluggish and cold this morning, might you warm our hearts? Thrill us, Lord God, as you... Confront us in your word and show us yourself and change us, we pray. Make us like our Lord Jesus. Remind us again of the invitation we have in the gospel. Oh, help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've got your Bibles, do you want to turn with me to Psalm 3? Psalm 3. And we read that this is a psalm of David uh, when he fled his son Absalom. Psalm 3. You find the Psalms roughly in the middle of the Bible. It's like a big songbook. Um, and uh, we're going to read Psalm 3. Psalm 3. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory. The one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord. Deliver me, my God. Strike all of my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. For the Lord comes, from the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Amen. So uh, this is Psalm 3. It, it's funny, it's kind of really like the first psalm, because Psalms 1 and 2 are actually an introduction to the whole of the Psalter. And Psalms 1 and 2 give us some themes that we're likely to find as we go through the rest of the book of Psalms. And we've been introduced in Psalm 1, to the blessed man, to the happy man. I don't know whether you feel like happy people this morning, but we're told that the blessed happy man is the one who delights in God's word and knows it and hides it in his heart and lives by it. And Psalm 2, we're introduced to God's anointed king. And uh, we read of God's determination to establish his king. And though the nations and the peoples rage and plot, God has decided to establish his anointed king. And we, we're invited to take a refuge in him. So there's some of the themes. And we, we start in Psalm 3 by finding some of these themes in David's life. David wrote this psalm. But David's not the only one who sung it. Uh, lots of people sung it. You know, the Lord Jesus would have sung this psalm. The, psalm, the Psalms were Jesus' songbook, and uh, he would have sung Psalm 3. And we're going to think, what did it mean for David to sing it? What did it mean for Jesus to sing it? What would he have thought as he sang this psalm? And lastly, we're going to think, what about you and me? Can we sing Psalm 3? We can. And we're going to think what that looks like for us to sing Psalm 3 as well. So first of all, what did it mean for David to sing Psalm 3? It was... That night. Boys and girls, I don't know whether you've ever experienced a most terrifying night. 
Have you ever experienced a terrifying night? Are any, any of you scared of the dark here? No? You're a little bit scared of the dark? You know, we're not sure what's going to happen in the dark. We're a bit worried about the dark. Well, well, do you know that this was written on a terrifying night for David? We read at the beginning of, of the psalm, it says that it was written uh, when he fled from his son Absalom. You see, you can read that night, okay, in, in the book of 2 Samuel, uh, chapters 15 to 17, if you want to find out later what happened that night. But David's son, Absalom, had been plotting and raging against David, against the Lord's anointed. And he'd been saying things like this, okay. If you'd have come past Absalom in those days, Absalom would have said, oh, do you want to come over here a moment? Um, listen, if only I was the king, I'd do a much better job than my father. You know, I'd be a really good king, wouldn't I? And the people thought, I suppose maybe you would. And day by day he plotted until one day Absalom, David's son, crowned himself king. Put a crown on his head and he said, I'm the king now. And he's got so many people in, the, in David's kingdom to turn against David and come and join him that he starts to march on Jerusalem. Could you imagine that day? Hundreds of people marching towards Jerusalem. And poor David has just a handful of loyal friends. What's David going to do? What would he do? What would you do if you were the king on that dark, dark night? Well, David writes at the beginning of this psalm. He says, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me. Oh, there were so many. There were so many. And all that David can do is pack up of thing, his things very quickly. And with a small little group of friends, he, he has to flee and run away from Jerusalem. And there he is, with his head hung low, walking across the Kidron Valley with his small group of friends. And, and it wasn't even that, you know. On that night, that dark night, anyone who's anyone came out to curse David. Do you know, we read, as he, it was really not dark that night. As he walked across the Kidron Valley, this man called Shimei came out. And he started to pour down curses on David. He shouted, you worthless man, <laughs> you're evil be on your head. And he picked up bits of earth and he started to throw it at David. Poor David. His head is hung low. And people are cursing him. They're shouting, he says, verse 2. Many are saying, God will not deliver him. God won't save him. Now, in the uh, Hebrew, there's something, a little selah here. We're not quite sure what it means. But maybe it means, have a break. <laughs> okay. Now, have a break for a moment. And just ask yourself the question, what is David going to do? What's he going to do? What would you do if you were on that dark night and all of your friends had betrayed you and turned against you and they were even cursing you? What would you do? What would you do? Tell God. Do you know, that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> that is a wonderful thing, okay, because that's exactly what, what David does. You know, maybe you can sing this psalm this week too. He does tell God. You see, verses 1 and 2 are like his complaint. And he brings his complaint to God and he says, this is how it is. Everyone is raging against me. It feels like you've forgotten me. Do you ever feel like that? I think we all feel like that from time to time. But as David lays his complaint to God, he, secondly, he remembers his confidence in God. Have a look at your psalm again if you've got your Bibles. Verses 3 and 4, his confidence, he says. But you, Lord, you're a shield. You're like a shield around me. Boys and girls, what do, what do shields do? They, they protect you, don't they? If you've got a shield, yeah? And David remembers, he says, you're, he says to God, you're a shield around me. You're my glory. And you're the lifter of my head. These are some lovely words. To remember. Do you know, boys and girls, as adults, we're very, we've got very poor memories and we don't remember things very well. But if you could remember verses like this, 
it would really stand you in great stead as you grow older. Imagine you learnt that little verse. It's a lovely verse. You, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head high. David is a bit like the Psalm 1 man. He's got all of God's promises in his heart, so that on that day of terror and darkness, he remembers what's in his heart, God's word. And he remembers that God has promised to Abraham that I will be your shield and very great reward. And he prays it back to God. And he knows that on that dark night that there's nothing really good about him. It's not his daring or cleverness. If any good was going to come tonight, then it's from the glory of God. And he knows that if his head is to be lifted high that night, that God is going to have to lift his head high. Boys and girls, have you ever come home from work, from school, and your head is hung low like this? And does your mum and dad, have they ever said to you, chin up? Has anyone ever said that to you? Chin up? What they mean is, come on, it's not that bad, is it? Lift your chin. The thing is, if you'd have said to David that night, chin up, David, he'd have said, I can't hold my chin up. Can't you see what's happening? Can't you see how many have turned against me? I can't hold my chin up tonight, David would say. But, but God can lift my head high. Back then, in, in David's time, okay, if there was an invading king, um, let's say, okay, that, that Jim is the invading king, okay, and uh, he comes along and he's, he's terribly scary, okay, and he comes to me and I'm the, the, the conquered king. Do you know what would happen? Jim would come to me and he'd put my head on the floor. This is what would really happen. And Jim would put his head on my neck. And it was a picture of absolute humiliation to this conquered king. And David feels like that. He says, I feel like Absalom, my son, has almost got his foot on my neck. I'm down there. And his foot is almost on my neck and there's no way out. And yet, he says, I know Psalm 2. <laughs> and I know that, that somehow I'm wrapped up in God's plans. And God has established his anointed king. And he will lift my head this night. This is tremendous confidence he has, isn't it? And then he carries on. Um, and he, he calls out to God. Has anybody here ever been mugged? Has anyone been mugged? I've never been mugged. I imagine if I was Jim, okay, if I was being mugged, Jim's got quite a, a presence about him, hasn't he? I think, he, he, I think if I was going to mug Jim, he just, I, I would run away. <laughs> he's, he's such a, a towering figure. Um, and I know how strong those teeth are. And, uh, <laughs> and it would, I, but, but if you were going to mug me, it would be very different. Because I'm, I'm small and I'm weak. And uh, if you were going to mug me, I, all I could do is cry out. I'd, I'd say, help! I would just cry, help! And this night for David was like a terrible mugging. His son Absalom was mugging him. He was stealing the kingdom from under his nose. And he can't do anything about it. He feels so weak. And he just calls out in verse 4, I call out to the Lord. He's got confidence in him and he calls out, Lord, oh Lord. And God answers him from his holy hymn. He's, he's, he's got his complaint and yet he's got this tremendous confidence in God. And then thirdly, and this is wonderful, and this is what drew me to this psalm. Verses 5 and 6, all of a sudden, there is a great calm that comes over the psalm, a calm. In the middle of that terror and fighting and, and running away, there's a lovely calm that comes over the psalm. And it's even more wonderful when you realise what night it was. Verse 5, I, lie, I lay down and I sleep. I lay down and I sleep and I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I find this absolutely remarkable. When you, when you think about what night it was and what was happening to David, that he can actually pen those words. 
That night, his uh, trusted counsellor, he had a bit of a mouthful as a name, it was Ahithophel. Can you say that? It's a difficult name to say. Ahithophel, okay. And Ahithophel had betrayed him, and he'd gone over to his son's side, Absalom. And that night, Ahithophel had said to Absalom, Absalom, listen, I know what we need to do about your father, David. You can read about it in 2 Samuel. We need to take 12,000 men and strike him while he's weak. Have you ever seen 12,000 men, boys and girls? There's a lot. I've never seen. I don't think I've ever seen a crowd that big. But that's what was at his disposal. Have you seen 12,000 men? There's a lot of people. 12,000 men. And the elders of Israel said to Ahithophel, Ahithophel, that sounds a really good idea. Let's do that. And Absalom said, Ahithophel, that sounds like a really good idea. Let's do it. And there's David fleeing for his life. And he's in the dark of that night. And any moment now, he knows what his advisor is going to advise Absalom. And he's looking out over the hill. And any moment now, he's expecting 12,000 men to pop up over the hill. Could you imagine feeling like that? 12,000 men wanting to kill you. Now, what would you do? This is what David does. <laughs> I find this remarkable. He says, good night. <laughs> he says, I'm going to lie down and I'm going to have a sleep now. Isn't that amazing? I find that, I find that phenomenal. I'm going to have a sleep now. He lies down. I can't think of a moment on that night when he could have actually found time to sleep. And yet he must have made a point of it. He says, I'm going to stop now and I'm going to sleep. And he lies down and he sleeps. What he's doing is he's saying, I trust God completely this night. I trust him that he's in control of all things. And though tens of thousands might pop over, up over that hill, I entrust them to him. And I'm going to show that by lying down and sleeping. Amazing. Do you know, if you read um, uh, two th Samuel chapters 15 to 17, you'll find that actually Hushai came and gave some really rubbish advice to Absalom and said, oh, don't go tonight. Um, Let's go another day. And we read that God determined to frustrate the plans of Ahithophel so that Absalom would come to ruin. Because God determined. Because God is in control. And that's what David trusts as he lays down and goes to sleep. And then lastly, okay, arise, Lord. He shouts, so we've had confidence, we've had a... So we've had a complaint, confidence, a calm, and lastly, a great cry. As David shouts out, Arise, Lord! Wouldn't you come and deliver me today? Deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. David prays that God would deliver him from the great enemies of that night. You know, behind the enemies of Absalom and Ahithophel and the thousands who are rising up against him, he knows that there stands a ferocious enemy that God has promised to crush the head of Satan in Genesis chapter 3. He prays, God, wouldn't you come this night and, and bring great deliverance, crush my enemies on the head? And then, most remarkably, Again, okay, I find this remarkable. He prays, God, would you bless your people? And who are the people that, God, that, that David is praying blessing for? It is those who are rising up against him. Those who are plotting and scheming and determined to kill him. David says on the dark, dark night of his life, I pray that you might bless them. Your blessing be on your people. That's how David sang that psalm. Isn't that remarkable? It's a remarkable psalm of fearless sleep in the midst of terror and darkness and fear because he trusted in his God. And we're going we're gonna to sing now. Uh, we're going to sing a song that, that talks of that wonderful confidence we can have though the nations rage that we can trust in our God. So would you, do you want to stand with, stand with me? And we're going to sting, though the nations rage, though kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king. Uh, so let's stand and sing this hymn together.
please. Do have a seat. Briefly now, I just want to go through the psalm again. But this time to think, how did Jesus sing it? Okay, we've seen how David sang it. But do you know, Jesus sang this psalm too. Like I said, it was his, it was his psalter. What was going through his mind as he sang these words? Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. God will not deliver him. Do you know, Jesus came to his own, we read, and his own didn't receive him. As you read of Jesus' life through the Gospels, you find, to begin with, he was really popular, where crowds of thousands came out, and yet he followed a trajectory of increasing loneliness and rejection. We read that the nations rejected him. Towards the end of his life, the Gentiles plotted and condemned him to death. And we read that his own people, the Jews, they plotted together and condemned him to death. And we read that his own friends, boys and girls, think about your close friends, and you think, would they ever leave me? Well, Jesus' close friends left him. Until by the end of his life, he was this lonely, solitary figure, all alone, on a cross, in the dark, when even his friends had left him. And Jesus could have sung these words. Oh Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. In fact, as you read in Matthew's Gospel, as the crowds walk past his cross, as he, sta- lies, as he hangs there in the dark, they were almost saying these words, God won't deliver him. That's what they said as they walked past. That would have been Jesus' complaint. He could have prayed that because he knew where things were heading. In the sea law, just pause and reflect. But you know, Jesus sang with great confidence. He could have sang those next verses. You, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy hill. You see, Jesus, more than any man who's ever lived, more than any man in history, was the Psalm 1 man. He was the man who had God's promises in his heart, day and night. Do we not read of Jesus spending nights alone in prayer with his father? As he, as he, as he poured out his heart to him, as he remembered God's promises and prayed them back to his father. Yes, Jesus was the Psalm 1 man who had great confidence in his God. And he was the Psalm 2 man. He was the anointed king. And he was certain that he was wrapped up in God's plans to be the anointed king. And God would establish him. Such confidence he had. He prayed that God's glory, God's name would be lifted high through him. And he knew that God his father would lift his head high And he calls out to him. We read in Hebrews chapter 5 that with loud cries, he prayed to his father that he might hear him. Yes, Jesus would have sung these words and he'd have known what they meant for him as the anointed king. Complaint, great confidence. And yet he knew of a calmness that maybe we have never ever experienced. As you study the life of Jesus, I don't know, maybe there's some here this morning who are checking Jesus out. But as you look at his life, you'll see of one who had an absolute calm assurance about him. We read of one day, boys and girls, you probably know this story, of a storm. A storm. And his disciples feared for their lives and they turned to Jesus. And guess what? Jesus is asleep in the storm. Could you sleep in a storm? I couldn't sleep in a storm. But Jesus could sing those words, I lie down and I sleep. Because of his 
complete confidence in his father. I lie down and I sleep and I wake again because the Lord sustained me. But as we read these verses, there's something else here. As we read these verses along with the church before us, we can see something else. Because the Lord Jesus one day lay down in the sleep of death. One night, a dark, dark night, when Jesus hung on a cross, he lay down and he slept the sleep of death. The Lord's anointed king died on a cross and yet three days later, hallelujah, God woke him up. <laughs> That's what we read in this psalm. I lay down and sleep and I awake again for the Lord sustains me. Three days later, Jesus woke again as God roused him from death, the death sleep. Jesus rose again. This is Resurrection Sunday. It's, it's the day we, we remember Jesus is alive. He rose again. Hallelujah. Jesus, as he sang these words, knew that he had come to answer the cry of David. You see, as you carry on uh, those those verses, David cried, Arise, Lord, come and break the teeth of my enemies. And we look at Jesus rising from the dead, sleeping and rising. And this is God answering the cry of David all those hundreds of years before. Here is God rising Jesus to deliver us from the biggest enemies that we face. Boys and girls, I don't know what kind of enemies you're afraid of, but there's three pretty mean enemies that the Bible tells us about. Really nasty thugs, really intimidating. There's Satan, and he's a mean thug. And there's death, something that is an icy figure at the end of our lives that we're all afraid of. And there's our sin that weighs us down like a terrible burden. And at the cross, Jesus confronts all of those foes and he breaks their teeth as he dies and he rises again. Yes, Jesus is alive. And uh, this is how Jesus sang these, this psalm. And as, he, as we end this psalm, we, we read those wor words of David um, praying blessing on the people of Israel. And don't you think it's curious that in the darkness of that dark night when Jesus lay down in sleep on the cross, that he actually calls that God might forgive those who were crucifying him. He prays that God's blessing might be on the very people who are crucifying him. He prays for blessing on people like us who've turned our backs on him that we might be blessed because he lies down in sleep and God sustains him and wakes him up on the third day. Yes, what wonderful words we find in Psalm 3, how Jesus sang those words too. These are, are almost too wonderful to imagine, but they're true because they're here in the Bible. And we're going we're gonna to stand and sing again, if, uh, if you could join with me, of the wondrous mystery of the full meaning of this psalm, that God should send his son to be us, to stand in for us at the cross and to die and rise and break the teeth of Satan and death and our sin. Let's uh, stand. Would you come and stand with me and sing this wonderful hymn of, of mystery as we consider the truth of the gospel? Amen. <clears throat> he is alive. Uh, that's how Jesus, that's what it meant for Jesus to sing that, that psalm. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus is alive? It changes everything. It really does. So as we close this morning, I want to ask really the most pressing question. How do we sing this psalm? Can you sing this psalm this week? You can sing this psalm this week. But before we go through it, I, I need to just outline how you can sing this psalm this week. You see, the Lord Jesus has come and he has died on the cross, rejected by all men, 
and loneliness hanging in the dark. He slept the sleep of death and God has raised him to life. And he's, in so doing, he's broken the curse. He's broken Satan and, and our sin and, and death. It's all, it's all changed. And because Jesus is the fullness of God dwelling bodily, he is the God-man, okay, and he's victorious, yeah, then you sing this song by being in him. This morning, if you're a believer, then you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. As he dies, you've died with him. And as he rises from the grave, you have risen with him. That is to say that as he is victorious, then so are you. And so as we come to this psalm, you have to find yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. So shall we sing it again? This is... This is wonderful. This is how you sing Psalm 3 this week. Lord, how many are my foes? How many are rising against me? Many are saying God will not deliver him. I have to say, brothers and sisters, that the voices can be really loud sometimes. Do you hear those voices? And they accuse you from within... Do you hear them sometimes saying, God will not forgive you? Or maybe those voices say, you've let him down so many times this week. Surely there's going to be an end to his mercy. And those voices can be very loud. And we bring our complaint to God as we hear those voices. Every week, every day, this is our complaint. Now, If there's any here this morning who are not a Christian, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, then I'm afraid to say that you have to stop at this point in the psalm. You can't come any further. You have to stop because that is where you are with those voices accusing you of your sin before God. And you've got it. And those voices are very loud. But if I can call you this morning, my brother, and my sister, if you're a Christian this morning, then, then please carry on with me as we go through the psalm. Because things really are very wonderful. Because we go from complaint now over to confidence. Because you're in him. You're in the Lord Jesus Christ who's died and risen from the grave. And so we go on now. Would you sing with me these wonderful words? But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory and the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy hill. Brothers and sisters, we have a tremendous confidence in the promises of our God towards his children. He's promised that he will protect you. That although there's nothing glorious in you, God calls Broken lives to himself. People like you and me with our fractured, shameful, broken lives. And he does glorious things. He brings his resurrection life into your life and makes it something glorious. Though you are a cracked jar, the treasure of the risen Lord Jesus is within you. And that is something very precious that shines very brightly even though we're very cracked. Because we're very cracked, it shines all the brighter. A glorious thing that God is doing in your life uh, this morning. And we can call out to him and he answers us from his holy hill because somehow we find ourselves wrapped up in the plans of God. What he's doing, what he's planned to do and what he will do for his children, for you and for me. If you're in Christ this morning, maybe in the Selah, you could remember some of the promises of God, that he'll never leave you or forsake you, that he's gone ahead to prepare a place for you. Maybe in those moments this week of quiet, don't stay at the complaint, move on to the confidence that you can have as a believer. And then 
move on then into the calm of the psalm. The calm of the psalm. I lie down and I sleep. I awake again because the Lord sustains me. The thing is about sleep. Do you have trouble sleeping? I do sometimes. Do you have trouble sleeping? The, pro- the thing is about, the thing is about sleep. Is that you put your head on your pillow and you say, well, I'm going to sleep now. But, but all of a sudden, do you experience this? It's just at that very moment that your head fills with all of the worries about tomorrow and all of the burdens of today. And you can't go to sleep because you're worrying about tomorrow. Do you feel like that sometimes? I do. I do. There's something spiritual about sleep. Sometimes we we say, well, it's the coffee that stops me sleeping, and it does. Or sometimes we say it's the really stressful job. Well, that does stop you sleeping as well. But there is something spiritual. Spiritual about sleep. David tells us that there's something about casting your burdens onto him because he cares for you. And as you lie down tonight, put your head on your pillow, as a Christian, you can close your eyes trusting that your father is watching over you and somehow you're wrapped up in his plans. The world, when it goes to sleep, It's entrusting itself to the laws of nature, but you're entrusting yourself to a father who cares for you. Rarely do I go to sleep and think, right, that's it. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow. Do you ever think? No, we don't think like that, do we? We think, I'm going to wake up tomorrow. But the reason we can think that is only by the grace of God. Because your father is watching over you, even as you sleep. And one day, We will sleep the sleep of death. (laughs) And we will awake again because Jesus has died and risen. You'll awake with the Lord Jesus Christ. Complaint, confidence, calm, cry. There's a great cry in the psalm that we cry with David and with Jesus. And it's a cry of victory. Um, Has anyone here ever Cuddled a lion. No? I, I don't think I'd want to cuddle a lion. <laughs> why, why wouldn't you want to cuddle a lion? Why wouldn't you want to cuddle a lion? Why would they hurt you? How could they hurt you? How could a lion hurt you? Sharp teeth, yeah. Sharp teeth and nasty claws. Yeah? I wouldn't like to cuddle a lion because it's got sharp teeth and nasty claws. But, hang on a moment, imagine, imagine for a moment that someone came along and they took all the teeth out of the lion and they declawed him. I think then I would like to snuggle up. Would you? He would become rather cuddly, I think, with no teeth and no claws. Would you like to? I think so. I think so. And the thing is, is that in this psalm we read, David cried, would you break the teeth? of my enemy and as Jesus died and rose he broke the teeth of our enemy so that death that once stood so such an icy figure at the end of our life that we were afraid of he's now become almost like a cuddly lion it's like a door now that just opens up so that you'll you close your eyes one day and you wake with the Lord Jesus Christ isn't that wonderful he's almost our friend now how, how things have changed because Jesus has died and risen. And Satan, who once accused you, can no longer accuse you because Jesus has died and risen. He's got nothing to accuse you of because Jesus has taken your sin as far as the east is from the west. He's taken it from you. And so he has broken the teeth of our enemies. And so this, this, this week, as you, as you sing this psalm together, remember the confidence, remember the calm, and cry in victory because you're in Christ. He's broken the teeth of my enemy. Amen. And then lastly, as Jesus, as you remember him on the cross, praying for his enemies in the dark, do you remember? 
And you remember David praying for his enemies on his dark night? We can even pray, may your blessing be on your people. My dad used to say to me, when I was, when I was full of the troubles and the woes of, of life, he used to say to me, Adam, you have got a bad case of the poor old me's today. Uh, and, and I did, and often did. We become like that, don't we, sometimes? When everything's so black, we, we turn in on ourselves. Might you this week, as you sing Psalm 3, pray for other people in your darkness. And as you pray for other people, other people can be most irritating and hurtful. But even in the dark, as you pray for them, you're, you're almost... You're brought out into the bigger picture of what God is doing for his church, of taking other broken people, broken and fractured lives, and bringing glory into their lives. And in the dark, pray for them. And as you pray for them, you, you see an almost bigger picture of what God is doing, and you can always go back to the beginning of Psalm 3 all over again and sing it again, but with a bigger idea of what God is doing for his church. So... That is how you can sing Psalm 3 this week. You bring your complaint. You come with great confidence. And you can have a great calm in life in the midst of the darkness. And you cry. And it's not a cry of anguish. It's a cry of, of victory because you're in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who died and risen and broken the teeth of those mean enemies who once stood against you. And if there's anyone here this morning who, who stopped at, Psalm, at verse 1 and 2, please, this morning could be your opportunity to sing the rest of the psalm. <laughs> you can know this Jesus. You find him in the pages of scripture. And you come and you, you own him as yourself, as your own. He can be yours. You can be his as you come with your sin and your brokenness and your fractured life. And he brings newness into your life. Amen. Uh, that is Psalm 3. Would you join me with me as I pray? And then uh, I'm going to hand over to Jim to, to, to finish off. Let's, let's pray. Father God in heaven. Father God in heaven, I thank you for your great plan that we've almost traversed the, throughout the pages of Scripture. And we find ourselves in that plan. Little us. Little broken us. With our significant worries and difficulties. And we find ourselves not on our own. But you invite us, you call us to find ourselves in Christ. And Lord, as a church, we revel in that this morning. We delight in him. We worship our Lord Jesus. And we celebrate and cry with, with, with great joy in the dark the promises that are ours because of him. Oh, help us this week to sing this psalm again and again and again. As daily we have to cast ourselves on the Lord Jesus Christ as our only confidence. Help this church, we pray, to be a beacon of light. As, as ones and twos disperse and we go to our places of work or, or our family, might we display the confidence and the joy and the delight that we have in our Lord Jesus to those around us. And might others come and find this joy and confidence in him. Oh, we pray for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.